yeah, consumption disparity, the elephant in the COP26 room. Uh, you, you may wonder what that little symbol is there. Uh, that actually is a, a symbol for the uh, global disparity. It's the shame, champagne glass diagram. You'll recognise the champagne glass shape, but we'll come to that a bit later. But um, firstly, uh, a bit of an introduction. Um, code Red for Humanity. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the most recent uh, UN report, uh, Emissions Gap. The heat is on. A world of climate promises not yet delivered. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, uh, COP26 is being held in Glasgow, which is uh, hugely important for the planet and also its people. And I must say, it looks very grim. Um, the recent UN uh, report there, the heat is on, warns that uh, even if all 2030 climate targets are met, the planet will still heat by, uh, by around three degrees this century, which would make life uh, unbearable. And while my country, uh, Australia, would suffer 50 degree heat waves and uh, even more severe fires, floods and more, the outlook is more devastating for less wealthy nations. For example, there's an island nation not far from Australia called uh, Kiribati, uh, which will be uh, underwater. So they're very concerned and uh, it's a matter of human rights. And I've got to say that unfortunately, Australia is not doing enough by far. Um, but um, wealthy uh, high emitting countries uh, must lead the way with stronger pledges and agree on terms to finance climate mitigation and adaptation in poorer countries. But disparities within countries are also increasingly important. So the, uh, the wealthy emitters um, must be targeted wherever they are. And we have to go after them. <laughs> But amid all the pledges in, um, in uh, COP26, uh, the root cause of overconsumption is unlikely to be um, mentioned, especially the issue of global disparity. Countries such as Australia still expect to, uh, to meet targets while they continue high consuming policies and practices. Um, so I'll, I'll begin by highlighting these disparities in resource consumption and carbon. And then next, we'll consider why these disparities matter and why they are relevant to COP26. Um, I will also focus a bit on the built environment, uh, which as Victor mentioned is my, uh, my main background area. And it happens to be the biggest consumer of all. So the built environment is terribly important in, uh, in reducing emissions. And finally, uh, we'll, we'll examine ways to overcome the disparities and, and try to rebalance consumption and social livelihoods. So, you know, how do we do it? Uh, that's the big question. Um, yeah, this is the... Um, effects of the Anthropocene are so bad that they are even appearing on uh, geological formations, even not far from my city. Um, but climate change forms part of a bigger picture, uh, which includes um, biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, freshwater shortages, and land system change. It's one of the nine planetary boundaries and you can see those in that diagram there, that circular diagram. You can see climate change, which is, has most of the attention at the moment, is um, but one, one of nine. So it's important to keep that in mind. Anyway, the scientists, um, they mapped uh, indicators of human activity 
such as transport, energy, tourism, etc., against uh, indicators of the earth system, water use, fishing and agriculture. And what they found in a series of graphs is that all the graphs skyrocketed, uh, like that graph shown on the right, they were all heading highly, heading upwards into a very unsustainable space. And if you note the, um, if you can see there the hypothesis two, the downward dotted line, that's, that's what, what we need to do, which is a huge transformation. Uh, they call it a dramatic social transformation. And that's required to reach a safe space. Otherwise, we'll be in a, a shocking uh, zone. And um, also, um, a professor who's uh, one of the leaders of the research on the Anthropocene, Professor Will Stephan from Australia, he said the major cause of the Anthropocene um, is, is consumption. And he also highlighted uh, inequitable consumption. And he pointed out this, uh, uh, this statistic, we have made enough concrete to create an exact replica of planet Earth two millimeters thick. So can you imagine that? How much concrete to cover the whole globe? And also we've produced enough plastic to wrap the Earth in clean field, film. So it's a huge, um, a huge problem. But turning to uh, consumption disparities, first I'd like to take a historical perspective, which uh, Professor Victor Powell um, says is so important. And I, I agree, Victor. <laughs> um, so we, we travel back to um, 1992, when the Rio conference was held, and, uh, and when the Climate Change Treaty and the UNFCC was actually established. And uh, that was later signed up in 94. And at the Rio conference, consumption disparity was very much on the agenda. And the, the UNDP, the UN Development Programme, highlighted this in its 1992 Human Development Report visualized by the classic champagne glass diagram. And actually that diagram came from the front of the UN report. Um, and the diagram is a symbol of conspicuous consumption. The diagram shows resource consumption in relation to world population, according to five income groups. You can see the five bands there. And as uh, Julian Cham Chamkin wrote in 2014, I'll just quote his words, which I, I like. The diagram is beautifully clear. It shows wealth and poverty, haves and have nots. The richest 20% are at the top. They own and wallow in that wide bit of wealth. Everything is theirs. On the other hand, the poorest 20% of the poorest, uh, uh, the poorest 50% uh, are at the bottom. All they have is the sad, spindly, narrow bit, and they have all the rest of the world weighing down on them. So imagine that. So if you keep that in mind, I think it's terribly important. Um, but again, uh, a strategy to overcome this was also developed around that time by um, Professor Friedrich uh, schmidt Bleek um, and colleagues from the Factor 10 Institute. He, he produced this uh, material flow reduction scheme around 94, showing different and converging pathways for the global north um, and the south. And um, the North should reduce consumption in that dotted line um, by a factor of 10, around 90% by within 50 years, 
enabling the South to initially double its resource use. You can see that dotted line going up um, before itself reducing and converging with the other curve. So um, that, that again, I feel is uh, very important and it's often forgotten. And Professor Smith Bleak, he also proposed uh, ways to reduce and to achieve this. He talked about the concept of dematerialization, uh, delivering services with less uh, material consumption. And he also introduced the, um, the metric of uh, material input per unit, unit of service. It was called MIPS. And so, um, so that, that is for um, consumption disparities. And now we come to carbon disparities. And I should say that uh, consumption and carbon kind of go together because uh, the more you consume, the more carbon you produce. And uh, the champagne glass diagram you can see here reappeared in the uh, Oxfam report of 2015 entitled Extreme Carbon Inequality. And as you can see, nothing has changed. Again, the poorest people on the planet are not only least responsible for causing climate change, they are also the most, most vulnerable to its consequences and least prepared to cope. And in order to rebalance, uh, the UN highlighted the mass massive shift required by the wealthier 48% of the population. And you can see that in the diagram on the right. The wealthiest of 1% uh, in, in red, the top 1% income earners, would need to cut consumption by a staggering 97% to reach per capita, that, that solid line there, per capita equal emissions of 2.1 tonnes carbon dioxide uh, uh, equivalent and by, by 2030. The top 10% in, in the, uh, the blue or purple would need to reduce their consumption carbon by 90%, which is still a huge amount. Whilst the uh, poorest, the bottom 50%, uh, could actually increase theirs by 300%. So you get the same sort of diagram, the same sort of theme as Professor Smith Bleak in the previous diagram. And uh, uh, as stated in the UN Emissions Gap Report, unequal access to finance is a key driver of disparities. And it actually, uh, the report, the 2021 report, actually highlights this pattern with the COVID response and investment. Wealthy economies, such as Australia, probably Finland, invest about US dollars, uh, $11,800 per person, whereas low income economies, invest only $57 per, per person. So there's a huge disparity. And, it, uh, and um, the point is that emerging economies, especially in the Asia Pacific, are likely to become top, top greenhouse gas emissions if climate finance does not increase. And uh, it's worth mentioning that while two thirds of the inequality um, in, in, in individual emissions was uh, due to inequalities between countries, inequalities between countries in 1990, the situation has now changed. 63% of this individual inequality is now, now due to gaps between high and low emitters within countries, within, so within Australia or within Finland. And uh, that fact came from uh, Lucas Chancel of the World Inequality Lab in Paris. And Chancel actually suggested some policy mechanisms to address this. He, um, he mentioned about measuring carbon emissions of individuals, 
focused on those embedded in consumption and investment port portfolios, like on fossil fuels, and also carbon and energy taxes that target wealthy uh, polluters and investments in polluting activities. Um, so the fair and, um, fair and safe space for humanity, uh, otherwise known as the donut economy you may have heard of, this safe and just space framework was developed by Leeds University. And it is simply demonstrated by the donut economy concept promoted by uh, Kate Roweth. And you can see the donut economy figure there on the right. Um, and the safe and just space is actually within the donut itself. But um, it actually involves um, various indicators for enabling a social foundation on the inner edge of the donut. You can see the social foundation uh, for, for housing, income and work, energy, water and food uh, within an overall ecological ceiling or planetary boundary on the outer edge which includes climate change and loss of biodiversity and uh, the other factors I mentioned. So again, uh, the ecological ceiling is the same as the planetary boundaries mentioned in the uh, Anthropocene diagram, if you recall. And also I draw your attention to this recent publication by the Hot or Cool Institute which is called 1.5 degree lifestyles towards a fair consumption space for all. So that's what we're trying to get to, that fair cons consumption space. And we're trying to avoid um, going beyond the ecological ceiling like Australia does uh, with a lot of red, or we're trying to avoid also going uh, within the within the donut uh, where you have a shortfall in all these factors a shortfall in food health education etc so um, um, one of the ways to achieve this um, this fair consumption space uh, mentioned by the hot or cool hot or cool institute is a social guarantee or universal basic services. And I noticed today I was looking at uh, COP26 and they're actually trailing, uh, trialing the idea of a, a universal travel pass, a free travel pass for all, which is great. And, and that actually embodies the idea of solidarity. Another means this uh, report talks about is uh, carbon rationing. And we can discuss that more in a minute. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, in terms of country comparisons and disparities, using the uh, the lead system, and you can find the web link there, we can actually compare countries in terms of their performance in achieving a social foundation within the ecological ceiling. And in the example. Um, Papua New Guinea and Australia are compared and we find that uh, poorer countries such as uh, Papua New Guinea are deficient in social foundation. You see there's some red bits of red, um, whereas they're not, uh, you know, there's some, la they're exceeding the boundary on land system change, but not, not much. But on the other hand, you look at Australia and other countries like Australia, and look at look at the red, all the red there. I mean, it's uh, it's shameful, and it needs to it needs to be dealt with. So, um, there is there is a ray of hope, however. Um, I recently I was very fortunate recently uh, to connect up with uh, Dr. Yamina Saheb, who who happens to be the lead author for the IPCC 
on climate change mitigation. <coughs> Excuse me. So she has a very important role and she's very busy right at the moment, as you can imagine, writing up the IPCC report. But uh, she's a tremendously inspirational person um, and she developed this um, framework um, which she's, uh, there's a publication which you can find at the bottom about this. Um, and this framework um, is sufficiency, efficiency and renewables, but sufficiency comes first in this SER framework, whereas usually sufficiency is the elephant in the room, it's forgotten. And she wrote this paper about COP26, she said, sufficiency should be first. Um, and this um, uh, sufficiency is, the way she defines it, and I would too, is avoiding the demand for energy materials, land, water, and other natural sources, while delivering well-being for all within planetary boundaries. Well-being for all, that's the social foundation we talked about before. And, um, and uh, in doing so, there's been a lot of talk about circularity, the circular economy, but the circular economy relates to efficiency. Um, it's not enough. We have to reduce absolute consumption, which is what uh, sufficiency is about. So, um, uh, Yamina also points out that there is an upper and lower boundary for sufficiency. Um, the upper limit is the remaining carbon budget with its normative target for distribution of equity. And the lower limit is provision of decent living standards. So we can imagine the richer countries uh, shrinking their consumption and emissions. So they are on the outer edge of the donut, whereas uh, poorer countries may initially get to the inner edge. Um, and sufficiency involves um, questioning demand for new buildings, reconsidering the need to build at all, uh, and reducing the size of new buildings. Um, so this, um, this leads to the next slide. Um, Yamina Saheb also drew this to my attention and it shows um, changes in floor area per capita, an indicator of sufficiency and GDP per capita among EU countries. And uh, I'd like to point out to you, uh, Victor and others, um, Finland is uh, very close to the top um, in terms of um, floor area. And uh, it's actually well above Hungary, which is down there. And also in terms of GDP on the horizontal, uh, Hungary is down the, the lower edge, whereas Finland and or Luxembourg is the, the highest. So, um, yeah, so, uh, um, and um, and this sufficiency idea and this this graph show that increase in floor area per capita rather than population growth drive both um, operational and uh, embodied carbon emissions in buildings and other areas. So um, so. Uh, uh, Yamina talks about this, she actually gave a presentation, which you can watch, which she talks about some of the solutions to this, is about, uh, you know, places like Finland and up there, reducing their area of, uh, how, this is about housing, by the way, I should have mentioned that, reducing their uh, per capita floor area in housing and, uh, and uh, combining, you know, with co-housing and things like that. But just to move on to the, um, the built environment. Um, yeah, I want to briefly highlight what all this means for the built environment, buildings and infrastructure, uh, which consumes over 40% of global resources, produces 40% of waste and around 39% of uh, emissions. So it's the most important sector. It's critically important. Um, and and um, um, 
the focus actually is shifting from uh, operational carbon, you know, the direct energy we use in buildings, to consumption carbon, which uh, includes uh, the energy and carbon in all the materials we use in building. Um, and I think I've already mentioned that, but most carbon can be saved by questioning demand, not building at all, building less and retrofitting. So that's sufficiency. Um, and there's a need for carbon budgets or caps. Um, current measures, um, carbon intensity per square metre are not enough because that's an efficiency measure. But um, uh, this, uh, this uh, the picture at the bottom is New York City, and I was really amazed to hear recently, and uh, Bill Gates actually uh, wrote this, would you believe? He pointed out that um, another New York City is being added to the planet every month and is expected to be added for the next 40 years. So this is what, you know, people in the US are thinking about. You know, they're going to keep on building. And he, I won't read all this out, but uh, just, just part of it, he said by one estimate, the world will add 2 trillion square feet of buildings by 2060. And um, this, uh, this raises the, uh, the question of um, where, where is this building going to happen? Because most of it needs to happen in the Asia Pacific, where people are poorer. We don't need to keep adding to the building stock in places like America. And it's hard to get this message across, but it's terribly important. They, you know, the wealthier parts of society, like I said before, they need to trim their consumption by around 90%, you know, and in Australia too. And this, need, this is not happening and must happen. And actually it is possible as our response to COVID-19 has shown, where you know, there's less need for real estate because a lot of services are being delivered online and just like we're doing now, you know, education, uh, business transactions, et cetera. So we need less new buildings and we need to retrofit. And actually, uh, uh, speaking of carbon budgets, I just wanted to mention that they seem the way forward and um, they're being introduced in parts of Europe, including Finland, including Finland. There's a well-known researcher at uh, Aalto University called uh, Marti Kutunen, who's uh, pursuing this path. So there's going to be top-down carbon budgets for sectors and for buildings. And I think that's the way to go. Uh, just quickly moving on, um, conspicuous consumption. Uh, a casino versus social housing. Um, you may have heard of the theory of um, Thurber, thermodynamics. Um, there's an author, Georgesco Rogan, who again wrote a long time ago in 1973 about this, and it's all about infinite growth cannot occur due to the first and second laws of thermodynamics. In every irreversible, irreversible transaction, such as mining, quality uh, is destroyed forever, or entropy, entropy, that word entropy, which is the capac capacity to satisfy human needs. And uh, another author, uh, Altvater, wrote, uh, entropy increase blots out conditions for human life on the planet. A thing may lose its use value if pro produced in excess. So, Use values are about, about uh, material and energy with low entro entropy. And this, uh, Georgesco Rogan, he wrote, every time we produce a Cadillac, or we can say a casino, uh, we irrevocably destroy an amount of low entropy that could otherwise be used for producing a plough or a spade. In other words, every time we produce a Cadillac or casino, we do it at the cost of decreasing human lives in future. And look at the, on the right, you can see the, <coughs> the new Crown Casino in Sydney, in Barangaroo. The whole, the whole so-called development is 490,000 square metres of floor space, can you believe? 
And uh, so it raises a question about, you know, where, where should we be putting our priorities? A casino such as that or into social housing? Um, and just to, um, I just wanted to, um, uh, to highlight this disparity uh, in the built environment. Um, in 2009, I was sent by the UN on a mission around Asia and I went to some very poor countries, Mongolia and uh, Thailand and so forth. And I really had my eyes open and I can tell you it was heartbreaking. It was really heartbreaking. And uh, also I went to Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And, um, and in Phnom Penh, uh, I was shown this uh, former cinema, which you can see on the left, the hammock sheet uh, cinema, where it's a former cinema and it's no longer that, but um, hundreds of people, and I mean hundreds of uh, poor men, women and children are living there in deplorable conditions. And you can see, I mean, I stood in the street and I saw this. You can see those openings there. Well, there's one of the openings in that picture. And there's people living inside there. And there's some of their, uh, their washing. And, um, uh, and so this, um, yeah, so this, this was described uh, as a living nightmare, as one writer said. And the lady there is a former film star who performed in that cinema, and now she happens to be living there in such shocking conditions, and she's around 80 years old. She struggles to survive. Meanwhile, not far away, and I went and saw this display, um, village dwellers were displaced on the so-called Diamond Island, <laughs> Diamond Island, to enable the construction of this so-called development for the for the rich for you know private investment so it's it's quite disgraceful um and just quickly moving on i'll just quickly go over the slide because i think we're getting close to about 40 minutes but um my colleague and i um, developed this conceptual model for the recent world resources forum um to guide more equitable exchange and trade uh, between the north and the south so on the right, you can see a country, say, from the global north um, has to shrink its uh, consumption, while the country on the south can uh, expand its, um, its uh, consumption somewhat um, for its uh, infrastructure and services. Um, and on the right hand side, countries, um, the richer countries such as Australia, must reduce their uh, ecological damage. You know, they must stop going beyond that, uh, the boundary of the safe uh, living space. And um, they must reduce consumption by sufficiency, circularity and so forth. Um, and uh, while on the left, uh, countries of the South, uh, while reducing resource extraction, um, and exporting less natural resources and commodities, provide more value-added products and services and improve their social livelihoods, their social foundation. And via synergistic relationship be the between the two, we were trying to show uh, the global north may uh, curtail its resource consumption and carbon while assisting its partner from the south to improve livelihoods and so forth. Um, so I'm just coming to the last slide um, and maybe we can, um, we can uh, have a discussion here. So is it, I pose the question, is it time for a revolution? Because the changes required are so dramatic and they are not happening. I mean, I can't believe they're going to happen at COP26 because, you know, Australia is going along there and uh, with the idea of still uh, still consuming and uh, also you know, still having coal and exporting coal. Um, so it's just uh, it's just shocking. Um, and so um, the question, you know, coming back to the question I asked in the title, uh, the elephant in the room at COP26 uh, is 
and probably, I suggest, uh, consumption disparities. Um, so how can we um, uh, how can we overcome this? Well, um, perhaps first and foremost is to uh, to try to change people's uh, value systems, you know, the general populace, um, to capture their hearts and minds, and uh, you know. Uh, and, and they need to understand ethics and compassion and empathy. I mean, I was lucky, I guess, because I, I suppose lucky is the right word, but I went around uh, Asia for the UN and I was exposed to these things. But unfortunately, in Australia, people are not exposed, although we have Indigenous disadvantage very much and very bad. Um, but um, the way forward, I think, uh, is uh, with Dr. Yamina Sahib, as I said, she's a ray of hope. Well, more than a ray, she's a, a bright light of hope. Uh, and she talks about sufficiency and reducing consumption disparities. Um, and, um, and so uh, the question is, will sufficiency be on the agenda for the COP25? They have a built environment event. Actually, it's called uh, Cities, Regions and Built Environment Day on 11th of November. And I wish they could watch this because um, I suspect all the discussion will be centered on efficiency and renewables, but they won't be talking about sufficiency. Um, and also wealthier countries uh, have to allocate US 100 billion per annum to support the disadvantaged countries, but they've been falling behind. And Australia is a very poor contributor. Um, and so I've listed some of the other mechanisms here, um, uh, especially targeting the uh, targeting the wealthy emitters and um, finances, which was mentioned before, and uh, taxes on luxury items, um, um, and um, but uh, techno fixes, um, and I remember. Uh, Victor, you mentioned this in one of your talks. Techno fixes are not the way. It's not going to achieve the change. Oh, sorry, I have to go back. Um, they're not going to uh, do, you know, achieve the dramatic change. They're playing around the edges, and a lot of the technologies are unproven and suspect, and so it's just not the way. So, um, you know. As I mentioned, and others have mentioned, uh, carbon rationing and carbon budgets uh, per capita caps um, seem to be the way. And others, and actually I'm beginning to think this, that uh, we need to move from the economic uh, capitalist growth to uh, people talk about a post-growth or even degrowth or, um, or solidarity, uh, social, and so social and solidarity economy. So I think we need to, we must go in that direction to get the change. The current, the current way is not doing the job. And so I just want to add that that's why I'm wearing my French beret, because we need, we, we need a revolution. So, um, and that slide there, um, actually I came across this artist and I saw an exhibition and it was in 2006 in Shanghai and it, it really, I thought it captured the spirit we, we need, and these were students, we need to have a dramatic change. So I think I'll leave that with you and perhaps we can have some discussion. So thanks, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, David. And uh, I think it is very sad that we don't have many listeners today and it also shows that, um, that uh, um, many, scientists many of our peers are um, searching for solutions searching for uh, fixes in uh, in another direction and uh, as you mentioned um, and we agree on that very much that uh, that we have very very grave doubts um, about um, about that path I wonder. I was wondering, Shashank, if you have a comment or question. If you want to go first, uh, I have listed some questions, but um, they can wait. Yeah, 
Thanks, Victor. And thank you, Professor David, for an excellent talk. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, so all through the time that you were presenting, I kept thinking. And with this last slide, I could actually connect to my uh, to my thoughts. So I would like to pick from the time for a revolution. So uh, in at least in India and uh, also worldwide, uh, I think it has been the the millennial generation, the younger generations show a greater awareness about the environmental conservation and its its implications. Uh, so so when when I think about the time for a revolution to bring about the uh, changes as promised in the COP, uh, COP held earlier at the Paris conference. So it, it seems next, I mean, it seems a very daunting task to me. So uh, for instance, in India uh, last year, uh, the, uh, uh, an environmental, a young environmental activist was arrested for supporting a farmer's movement. Then the, the entire political economy, the growth system is based on uh, the ideas of urbanization and the development driven by industrialization, fossil fuel extraction. So amid all these models, it seems, it seems a challenge to think of, uh, even to think about revolution. So who leads that revolution? Is it even possible to draw from bottom up or we need to work more at the top? So I'm struggling with that. If you can share some of your thoughts. On this. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, uh, Victor, uh, is it okay if I just respond? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Jasank. Uh, yeah, what I had in mind with the revolution, um, I was thinking, um, more about the um, more about the wealthier countries and the um, uh, you know people in Australia, um, you know I mean there there are big demonstrations and a lot of the younger people I mean I've been in demonstrations myself and uh, it's the younger people who uh, are going to be affected by all this because you can imagine you know in Australia. You know, we're going to have uh, 50 degree heat waves. I mean, uh, you know, already uh, we get up to around 45 degrees sometimes, but they're going to be more frequent. We're going to have more bushfires. So, um, uh, but our, our government is just not switched on to it. Um, so I, I, I think, um, yes, it's an interesting point you raise. Um, I hadn't considered about a revolution in places like India too. Um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think probably at uh, COP26, you know, countries like India, uh, you know, which they're trying to do, they're trying to get the wealthier countries to lift the heavy load, which is fair, because, you know, the per capita, um, per capita uh, carbon uh, in, in places like Australia, I mean, per capita carbon is five times the average person in China. I don't know what it is compared to India. Um, so, um, yeah, I think uh, I think that you know, at COP twenty six, uh, I would hope that uh, you know, countries like uh, India, you know, we've got Indonesia on our doorstep with huge numbers of people and. Uh, uh, you know, I've got a friend who uh, actually he left today on a flight back to Myanmar and uh, Myanmar, where they've got so much trouble. And he said, people in Myanmar, I mean, they, they don't consume anything. <laughs> you, know, you can imagine. So um, I think the revolution really needs to be, uh, yeah, maybe targeted at the, um, the you know, the... Uh, current economic systems, you know, the industrialized systems and economic growth uh, at one level, at the high level, um, and, then, and there's people talking about change, um, but also at the, you know, within countries, you know, you've got br very brave people like that, that uh, activist you mentioned, Shashank, who uh, 
are taking the lead. So yeah, but no, thanks for raising that. It, uh, it hadn't really occurred to me before, so thank you. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, I would like to uh, dig a little bit deeper in uh, one of, perhaps one of the main points of your talk that, um, um, first of all, you targeted the question, how to reduce our consumption. And then you have raised the, the importance of sufficiency as opposed to efficiency that has been um, a popular uh, theme or focus of uh, many researchers. And um, so I was wondering if, um, um, and I'm, I'm soliciting here your personal thoughts as well. They don't necessarily have to be standing up directly from, from your research. But what do you think um, we humans are, as history shows here, um, um, absolutely scared of um, hunger, uh, of uh, lacking basic necessities, and uh, human history is a string of events uh, until maybe the past 100, 200 years in certain countries. That is a string of famines, a string of natural disasters, a string of times of need. Is it possible that certain societies, certain countries, and humanity as a whole overcome somehow this, perhaps it's genetical, I have, I have no idea, um, this historically um, grounded fear of um, being in need that is driving us away from being poor and driving us toward consumption and having and owning and consuming. Yeah. Um, did, did you have any comment first, uh, Shashank, or do you? Yeah. No, no, thanks. Please go ahead. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Victor. You're always very deep thinking, and I respect that. Um, yes, uh, probably you're right. People are scared of, um, you know, uh, uh, not having the basic necessities, you know, that uh, social livelihood, um, even in, uh, you know, societies like, uh, like Australia, uh, because, um, you know, the bushfires... Um, uh, recently showed, you know, that, uh, you know, the devastation from natural disasters was, you know, tremendous. And people ended up, uh, you know, uh, lost their houses, lost every, you know, lost a lot. Um, so there is that fear. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, in Australia, we have, you know, quite good insurance systems and, the government, you know, uh, has lots of resources. Australia is a relatively rich country and, you know, they send in assistance. But I must say, even then, it doesn't always work well because uh, I think some of the people who suffered in the bushfires, you know, had to wait a very long time for assistance. Um, yeah, but so there's those people, but... Um, I think um, they're, they're more the, uh, you know, they're more the middle class, uh, uh, what can I say, middle income people, but um, the very wealthy, um, the very wealthy uh, very rarely find themselves in those, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the very wealthy, um, you know, they, uh, they inhabit uh, mansions and, uh, you know, in the newspapers here, uh, the, 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 the weekly newspaper has a section about mansions. So it's all about luxury and luxury houses, you know. I saw an advertisement today for a, uh, a luxury apartment in a proposed new building in my city. You know, the apartment would cost, uh, I don't know, a couple of million dollars. So those are the people um, those wealthy are, uh, you know, really big consumers that 
I think sufficiency needs to be targeted at. And so it's people in uh, India, although, again, in India, you know, as Shashank would know, uh, I've seen that there's some individuals who are, you know, very wealthy, maybe wealthier than some in Australia. So those people need to be really targeted because they're the big consumers and they're the big, uh, the big emitter, emitters. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you might have some other comments. Yes, I, I would like to continue in this way, uh, just maybe for a follow up question that um, do you think uh, it is possible and how it would be possible? I mean, if you presume that wealth, because what I see, okay, maybe, maybe I'll just go back a little bit. Uh, what I see is that wealth and being wealthy is often intertwined with a perception from some sort, some sort of human quality. Um, in Hungary, they say if the person is wealthy, he or she, normally it's a he in Hungary, he did something right. And I believe that behind that statement, behind the perception, there is some sort of a general um, um, uh, understanding of human value that is uh, often bound to uh, wealth and income and uh, social position or stratus. And I'm wondering if you would have a suggestion. I mean, you have touched upon this in your talk, but I was wondering if you would have a suggestion how to tackle this um, issue, um, how to tackle the wealthy um, efficiently. Because now what I see is that those who are not wealthy, they, in large numbers, they would love to be wealthy because it's not just about the money, but it's also about um, the social uh, position and uh, this perhaps attached uh, perceived human quality or, yeah, human, yeah. yeah, yeah. Perhaps you can say quality, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I think, um, it's because of, um, like you say, everyone aspires uh, to have more than the next person. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, the rich are promoted, uh, you know, in Australia, you know, there's like a rich list and people respect those. They get lots of respect and they get lots of attention. But I think probably it's... Um, it probably has something to do with the, you know, the current uh, economic system, which is built on, uh, you know, economic growth and, uh, you know, more wealth and prosperity, you know, wealth, more property, more assets. Um, but if we have a social transformation, um, which was mentioned, um, then, then we maybe then we can uh, promote the, the success factors as being, um, as being those, uh, the, the indicators of the, um, the social foundation and also uh, reducing, reducing uh, emissions. Yeah. So if a person is doing good, you know, for uh, all those, um, meeting all those social indicators, helping people, and uh, at the same time, uh, reducing their consumption, uh, we can hold those people up as, as models. And actually, um, one of the uh, reports I was reading, um, uh, and I, I've mentioned there about, um, people are suggesting that, uh, you know, countries have uh, carbon allocations and um, yeah, carbon caps, but um, uh, there needs to there needs to be uh, tracking and monitoring and measurement of individual emissions. And uh, yeah, so if if we have a like a metric where these rich people. Um, 
they can be shown, shown up. And I'll give you an example. Um, you remember recently that uh, that guy, uh, that American guy, I just can't remember his name, but he went into outer space recently. <laughs> and, you know, Elon, and Elon Musk, he was, maybe. Oh, uh, Musk, it was after Musk, it was another guy. Oh, sorry. Musk, yeah, Musk went up there too. They all go up there. <laughs> but uh, I read a statistic that uh, those uh, flights, they go into outer space for about, I don't know, not many minutes. But in doing so, they, they, they produce or generate 75 tonnes of carbon for that time. And if you compare that with the carbon of someone from a low-income country, that, that, that would be a lifetime carbon. So this, this rich list person is producing that in a few minutes. But if we could, if we could show that and show people, look, this guy is, is damaging the planet for everyone, then they won't look so good. They, they, you know, being so rich and wasteful and extravagant won't look so good. So I, I would suggest that as a way forward and others have suggested this per capita measuring of emissions. Thank you. I just took a note on that. I think this is great. This is very good. Um, sorry, there is some drilling uh, in the next uh, staircase. Um, they are renovating a building and installing a heat pump that uh, will produce about 70% of our heat, hopefully, uh, in the decades to come. So I am happy that the house is shifting to uh, a different mode of heating than using uh, nuclear energy or I don't know <laughs> I don't know what do they use uh, in the European Union finally renewables is biomass too so um, Finland is burning a lot of wood chips and that's uh, that's the biggest chunk of our renewables here it looks good on paper but it doesn't look good in reality so much yes um, so basically um, well this Maybe I didn't pay attention. So this was something that I uh, just realized now uh, that um, David, you, you suggest that it's not the middle, middle class if there is left, I don't know, uh, or the middle earners who are um, posing the greatest danger, um, but, uh, but it's the super rich. Um, oh, sorry if I just uh, interrupt you a second. Um... Um, it's it, actually at the top 1% I mentioned, uh, it's not just the super rich, because there was an article, someone wrote an article that uh, actually many people in Australia fall into that 1% uh, category. So uh, we, we, we don't just think, it's actually many of us. Um, and then we have the next, um, I forget the, 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 the percentage, um, the next category down, who have to reduce consumption by um, 90 percent. Um, um, yeah, so it's not just the super rich. Um, other people have said this too, but uh, probably, yeah, they are the really big consumers. You know, they they invest in uh, fossil fuels and. Uh, you know, a lot of pollution and get a lot of money from it. And, you know, Australia, we've got, you know, the coal lobby and a lot of rich people investing in that and the government supports them and it's, it's terrible. Yeah, um, um, and as you said about Finland, the floor space is, is quite huge. And uh, one of the selling points of the large houses, often these are not per se houses, they can be like... Uh, I'm not sure what would be in English, um, like a semi-detached house, like houses in a row. But they would be like the floor space would be very big, like several hundred square meters. And the selling point is that uh, per square meter, it's cheaper than 
uh, living in an apartment. So you get more value for your money. I mean, it costs a lot more because it's a lot bigger, but it costs um, in, in this area where we live, it starts with a half a million euro. Um, and in individual houses are about 1 million euros. But uh, you get so much more space. You know? <laughs> and uh, because we live uh, next to the sea and about six months a year, yeah, that's the sailing season here, approximately six months. So tens of thousands of people have their motorboats for six months. And this has been, you know, I, I have not look, looked into this, but, but I was always thinking about this, like Finland, supposed to be like a super green country. That's like the label. But people live in huge, huge houses and they live like individually or as couple. Families do not live together when the kids are old. Um, I mean, they're grown up. So it's like 400, 200, 300 square meters with two persons, plus maybe a motorboat, a couple of cars, maybe a vintage car too, because you know it looks nice in the summer, convertible for those five days you can, okay, 50 days you can use it. And so this is just, sounds to me like very, very wasteful in a country that is governed by the discussion of being green and being super green. And then the lifestyle is just a, a version of the lifestyle of North America and Western Europe. Yes, well, um, sounds very similar to Australia. You know, people uh, yeah, aspire to live in uh, very large, very large houses. Although um, you know the family sizes are reducing. You know, uh, you know before when I grew up, um, people had uh, you know larger blocks of land, and uh, you know there were larger families. But now there's more uh, more couples, and there's less need for um, for all this space. Um, but still, you're right. It just, it's the value system and uh, probably, you know, it gets back to the individual consumption. Um, but what you were saying uh, made me think about uh, when I was in Japan. Um, in Japan, I, uh, I stayed in a temple and, I, and uh, in Kyoto, I was very lucky and uh, it was beautiful. And, uh, you know, the Japanese uh, are very, uh, very good, um, you know, they use space to its maximum. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I was put in this room and I was given a, uh, a futon to lay on the floor uh, to sleep. And uh, in the morning uh, I got woken up and uh, the, uh, the monk, you know, it was like a, a Zen uh, Buddhist, uh, temple he came into the room and uh, you know and I got up and they rolled up my uh, futon and then he said his prayers he opened a cupboard in my room and uh, he said his prayers and so they have this they they use space much more efficiently I suppose because the Japanese you know there's so many people crowded into uh, the cities um, but um, yeah I um, um, yeah, I think, and the same with cars, because um, in Australia, you know, we have so-called green cars and, you know, electric cars, but, you know, um, they're very big. They're very big. Actually, I was watching in Australia today, we had a, a horse race. Every year we have this horse race and the whole country stops and people gamble, you know, there's a lot of money and a lot of wealth and extravagance. But the advertisement for the sponsor of the horse race was uh, Lexus and they're a car company, very expensive cars. And they, had, they were saying, oh, our cars are net zero, you know, net zero carbon. I thought, come, come on, you know, the cars are, uh, you know, they're, they're big. <laughs> and this applies to buildings too. You know, we have, uh, you know, those buildings I showed you, the casino and the buildings next to it. 
actually got uh, the highest green rating because of you know so-called green features but they were big and uh, they were extravagant so i'm actually trying to tackle that at the moment with some others but um, yeah so i'm not sure about in india uh, shashank uh, how that how people were the people uh, living in bigger houses or be interesting yeah thanks so um, in india we have a, a, a more like a global south kind of experience so especially in cities like mumbai uh, where i am right now so we live a, we have rented a very small place so maybe 300 square feet uh, it's a one room kitchen kind of a house and and so the culture is of nuclear families however as we go to smaller towns the the sizes of houses start growing bigger and bigger yeah and uh, the 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 number of uh, uh, assets so the holdings of cars and that also that that is almost following the trend in uh, usa Uh, but yes we have a huge crunch of space in bigger cities like delhi mumbai bangalore we have a huge crunch of space so uh, in the last 3 4 decades uh, apartments have come up multi storied apartments have come up earlier the, these were uh, row houses and the apartments have a real shortage of space uh, and it is eating into the so i live very next to a national park and so as i look from my window to the left uh, i can see the national park kind of so the area between our building used to border that national park but now uh, there is a huge slum spread in between the border of this this building and the national park and it is eating into the national park so these uh, slums are mostly from uh, lower economic uh, socio economic strata but then there are also larger corporate developers who have bribed the municipal corporation or somebody and might have gotten contracts to uh, have their constructions this is happening no thank you uh, i think uh, you've really brought that uh, that inequality home to us uh, Yeah, looking out your window, G. So it's really great to have you in this uh, conversation. Um, I haven't been to India, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I've been to uh, parts of Asia, but uh, not to India. And um, yeah. But anyway, Victor, did you have any? Um, actually, no. And uh, um, I was thinking. Well, maybe maybe you see it in a different way. But I, I thought that we have uh, had a, a very uh, a good and compact discussion. We are about seventy uh, something, seventy minutes approximately.